in the chat box, can somebody let uh, Tony know that uh, you can see my screen as well now? Is that good, Tony? You getting a yes? yes? That's good. All right. So I'm going to start with a land acknowledgement. So for those who are just joining us, welcome to the Fair Vote Canada webinar on alternative vote uh, or the winner take all ranked ballot. Um, I'd like to start by acknowledging that I live in Kitchener, Ontario, which is the home of the Haudenosaunee, Anishinaabe and neutral people. They have been here for tens of thousands of years and we are grateful to live and work and be able to do this webinar on their land. Okay, so Tony, if you want, you can turn your webcam um, off until we get to Q&A. Awesome. Okay, so welcome everyone to the webinar on the alternative vote, uh, the winner take all ranked ballot. So uh, I am joined today for the question and answer by Tony Hodgson, he's president of Fair Voting BC. And one thing really relevant here is that he collaborated with Byron Weber Becker um, from the University of Waterloo on a series of simulations to look at the degree of inequity produced by various voting systems, including the alternative vote for the Federal Electoral Reform Committee. Uh, Tony is also leading a charter challenge against first past the post. So when we get to Q&A, um, Tony will be able to help uh, answer a lot of more questions about AV alternative vote. So I wanted to start today with a review of what we always talk about in webinars, which is the idea of voting system families. So um, political scientists can complicate this a little bit more, but for our purposes here in Canada, there are basically two main families of voting systems. There are winner-take-all families that are not proportional. So systems uh, in the winner-take-all family would be first past the post, and you guessed it, alternative vote. And when you hear um, the media or politicians say ranked ballot, they are almost inevitably 99.999% of the time referring to the winner take all alternative vote system. So we are very aware that proportional systems can use ranked ballots and that's all wonderful and we've done webinars on that before. Um, but when I use the term ranked ballot in this webinar, I am referring to the alternative vote, the non-proportional system. So why am I doing this webinar? So there are many, many things that I'd rather be doing other than talking about alternative vote, pretty much anything actually, um, now that you mention it. The reason that we're doing this webinar is because we're in a serious situation in Ontario where the leader of the Liberal Party is pushing the alternative vote. And this has serious repercussions for the proportional representation movement all across Canada. So just to give you a little history for those who may be new to Fairville Canada, new to the PR movement and not uh, weren't around five years ago for the Federal Electoral Reform Committee, uh, when Justin Trudeau and the other parties promised to make every vote count and end first past the post and uh, Trudeau promised to listen to the experts and all that kind of stuff, right? We had a five month long, very intensive process um, where there was an electoral reform committee. They heard hundreds of experts. They heard experts from Canada. They heard experts from all over the world. They traveled doing hearings all across Canada. The Minister of Democratic Institutions traveled doing her own hearings across Canada. People, MPs did town halls. Uh, people came and testified. People wrote submissions, uh, the whole thing. Okay, so they spent five months and they probably heard from every single expert there is to hear from and close to it. And um, the parties were on the committee could call experts. So it's not like Fairville Canada stacked the electoral reform committee with our own experts. It's not like that at all. The parties would make lists of uh, who they would like to call as experts and the committee would decide who to call. And so the Liberals had plenty of time to dig up people in favor of the alternative vote. But unfortunately, at the end of the day, only 4% of the experts thought the alternative vote was a good idea for Canada. There was actually slightly more, about 7% who thought first past the post was the way to go, and 88% uh, supported PR. So that should tell you right there that there's not objectively a lot of evidence that alternative vote is going to do any of the things that we need to improve our politics. And at the end of that five months, the, they had a press conference uh, where the chair of the Electoral Reform Committee, Liberal MP Francis Scarpaleggia, you can see him there with his hands out, um, said nobody wants a ranked ballot. And when he said ranked ballot, he meant the winner take all uh, alternative vote. 
So then, of course, later we found out what was sort of obvious to some people from the beginning, that it had always been alternative vote or nothing from Justin Trudeau. And in Aaron Wary's book, he said something very interesting. He said, if I had to do it over again, I would have been making an aggressive case for the preferential ballot. Okay. So now fast forward to what we have in Ontario. So for those of you who don't live in Ontario, I'm going to give you a really, really quick uh, recap. So in Ontario, we basically have a we have close to a two party system. There have been a couple of instances where another party has governed or been in an agreement. But in general, if you look back over the last hundred years in Ontario, it's almost entirely liberal false majority replaced by conservative false majority replaced by liberal false majority. It's that's that's basically the 100 year history in Ontario. It's almost always majority governments and it's almost always false majorities. And it's basically one of the two big parties. And we haven't actually had a majority government elected with a majority of the vote for almost 100 years in Ontario. So in 2018 provincial election, what happened is the liberals got wiped out. Uh, they lost their official party status. It was very sad. They were in the third party position, just like the liberal federal liberals were uh, heading into the 2015 election. If this sounds familiar, um, Doug Ford's conservatives won a majority government with 40.5% of the vote. So obviously there's a problem, but what kind of a problem there might be probably depends on what perspective you're looking at it from. So in an effort to re-engage Ontarians, build popular support back for the Liberal Party heading into the election in Ontario coming up in June 2022, uh, this spring, the Ontario Liberal Party did a consultation. They invited all Ontarians to participate. They tell us hundreds of thousands of people participated in this online consultation, which ran for about uh, six weeks and looked at about 10 or 12 different topics. And on the week on voting systems, every vote count, every voice counts. 90.7% uh, of people who participated in this said they would like a proportional system. And 90% who participated said they don't want alternative vote or the winner take all ranked ballot for Ontario provincial elections. Um, so we were heard uh, loud and clear that the people who care a lot about this issue and participated definitely do not want alternative vote. So about three weeks ago, Ontario Liberal leader Stephen Del Duca announced uh, to his party convention, and it was in all the mainstream media, the Star, the Post, the Globe, the whole bit, that he'll bring in ranked ballots if he wins the election or he'll resign. So, um, you know, after about three years of attempted constructive uh, feedback and involvement and participation and encouraging of the Ontario Liberal Party to look at a citizen, new citizens assembly on electoral reform. Uh, what we got was basically, you know, my way or the highway. So and this puts the PR movement, unfortunately, in a pretty bad position, which is why we're on this webinar right now. So uh, right now, if you go on the Facebook ads library, which anybody can access, you can see that the Ontario Liberal Party are already testing out dozens of ads that either mention ranked ballot as the top thing they're selling along with the four day work week and all this stuff, right? Um, or they have ads that are getting ready to go just on selling ranked ballot. And here you're seeing one of the one of these ads from uh, Stephen Del Duca. Now the interesting thing right now is that each ad is a very small spend. So what either they're sitting them there waiting for the, the time to launch or they're and or they're testing them out and seeing uh, what's the most effective to get people to sign up so they can build their uh, their big choir to amplify all this kind of stuff. And here you can see another one and it's important to understand some of the things that Stephen Del Duca is saying and I'm about winner take all ranked ballots. Um, according to Del Duca, they're going to make things better for all of us. And they're going to put power back in the hands of voters. And they're going to make elections more optimistic and less polarizing. And the winner take all alternative vote, according to the Ontario Liberal Party, rewards parties that find common ground and speak to voters' hopes and not their fears. And in his speech announcing that he was running on this I'll push it through, I'll resign thing, he talked a lot about how he wants politics to be more collaborative and cooperative and all this kind of stuff. So we're going to look a little bit more in this webinar about whether alternative vote actually delivers those things. So alternative vote, what's the risk? What's the big deal? Um, who cares if Ontario gets alternative vote? 
So I'm going to be looking at a bunch of research. Here are some of the researchers that I'm going to be citing in this webinar. We'll start with Dennis Pilon. I'm sure he's familiar to those of you who are on uh, webinars with us quite a bit. He's one of the top electoral reform experts in Canada, and he spent his entire career the last 30 years looking at how and why voting systems change in democracies. So the politics behind it, as well as the mechanics of voting systems. Alan Renwick, who is the deputy director of the Constitution Unit at the UK College London. And again, he's a uh, world class electoral reform referendum and citizens assemblies expert. And Alan, along with uh, in collaboration with 18 other academics, wrote a briefing paper for the United Kingdom on the alternative vote when the United Kingdom had a referendum on AV in 2011. And the point of the briefing paper was to take an impartial, neutral, a totally objective look at what is this alternative vote and what effect would it likely have? And so I'll be coming back to that. I'll also be referring to the UK Independent Commission on the Voting System, which is sort of like our Law Commission of Canada. The UK went there too, and they have pronounced on the alternative vote for the United Kingdom. I'll be referring to Dave, the work of David Farrell, um, who is chair of politics at University College Dublin. He actually won an award for getting the Irish Citizens Assemblies, uh, which are now famous started. And he's a world famous electoral reform expert. He's authored 15 books on this, and he wrote a whole book with Ian McAllister on the alternative vote in Australia. And Harold Jansen, who studied the 30 years that AV was used in Canada, and I will be referring to that. So, so I don't have to repeat that. These are the main researchers that I'll be touching on. So we're going to look at proportionality. Is alternative vote more proportional? Is it like even somewhat more proportional? Is, does it give fair representation for voters of third or small parties? Does it benefit one party over the other? Does it make politics less adversarial and more cooperative? Would it put an end to strategic voting campaigns? And could it be a step towards PR? So the first thing to look at is who uses the alternative vote. And this is uh, probably a little bit of an entertaining map for you. So at the national level, um, the only two countries to use the alternative vote are Australia and Papua New Guinea. And Australia has been using alternative vote for about 110 years. So they got it and, and it's, it's here to stay. So in one sense, there's not a lot of experience around the world uh, with the use of alternative vote, but we have a very good test laboratory in Australia, a country that's really not so different from our own, to look at what the effects have been of it. The other experience we have to draw on for alternative vote is that we actually use this system at a provincial level for all the ridings outside of the major cities in Alberta and Manitoba. And that and it was used in all the ridings outside of Edmonton, Calgary, and Winnipeg for a period of 30 years. So that's plenty enough time to uh, get an idea of what the effects or non-effects of this system might be. It was also used for a couple of elections in BC. The reason I'm not talking so much about that is because it came and went so quickly that uh, there's really not a lot we can gain from that experience other than to reinforce the fact that it was brought in for partisan self-interest and it was removed for reasons of partisan self-interest. So let's start with proportionality, which is a key um, wish of every commission, committee and assembly that's ever looked at electoral reform in Canada. Uh, so this is kind of important and it's obviously important to Fair Vote Canada supporters. It's our reason for existing. So in 1997, the United Kingdom did a, uh, did a report. Uh, it was led by Roy Jenkins. The government asked uh, for an independent commission on the voting system, and it was led by the president of the European Commission. And also, uh, Roy Jenkins was a former uh, cabinet minister, so it wasn't like sort of an outsider radical. He was someone who was well-established uh, with credentials in the system, not a radical fellow by any chance. Uh, so he did all the things our Law Commission of Canada did in 2004. You know, he took public submissions, he did public hearings, he heard from all the experts, he ran focus groups, he visited countries around the world and heard from them about their systems. And here is what the Independent Commission on the Voting System concluded about alternative vote. It said, in some circumstances, AV is even less proportional than first past the post. Far from doing much to relieve disproportionality, alternative vote is capable of substantially adding to it. Its effects are disturbingly unpredictable. 
Now, fast forward to 2015 and 2016, rather, and the Federal Electoral Reform Committee that I talked about at the beginning. Uh, Byron Weaver Becker, who's a computer scientist at University of Waterloo and an electoral reform uh, advocate, he developed a program to simulate the results of elections using 32 different electoral system designs. And he also ran additional simulations to show what would happen if voters changed their mind, like what would happen to the results with each system if more voters shifted to this party as opposed to this party, you know, and so what he found was that alternative vote was the least proportional option that he simulated. I'm going to tell you what the composite, composite Gallagher is so that it sounds pretty geeky so that everybody knows what this quote means. So the Gallagher index is just an index that talks about how disproportional, how messed up are the results of an election. So if you had a Gallagher index score of zero, it would be 100% proportional, perfect match. Of course, that's not possible and it's not desirable. If you had a Gallagher score of say 15 or 20, that's really skewed. That's on the, the other end. Um, and what he found, uh, he also looked at the composite Gallagher. And what that is, is how disproportional are the results by region of the country, not just the overall results. Like if half the country uh, elected all liberals and half elected all conservatives, it might look like it sort of balances itself out and then it wouldn't look that bad. But meanwhile, most voters aren't electing anybody. So he looked at by region, how disproportional is it? And he found that the Gallagher index and the composite Gallagher of 24% was the worst of any system that he simulated. And at that point, he recommended that the committee um, ditch the alternative vote and issue a preliminary report saying this is the one system we're not looking at because basically it's a step backward in terms of the principles that the committee was asked to base their work on. Okay. So in terms of what alternative vote delivers, like I said, one of the main places we can look for a really good idea of how this works out is Australia. And one of the things you have to understand in Australia is that the alternative vote has basically turned Australia into a two party system. And the result of that has been that they rarely ever have a minority government. So if you're a fan of minority governments and the kind of, you know, somewhat co limited cooperation that occurs in minority governments, uh, they have not experienced that in Australia. Basically, it's turned it into one false majority government after another. And like Dennis Pilon says, the point of it is to manufacture a phony majority um, out of a popular vote minority. Alternative vote in Australia has also produced wrong winter elections, which is another thing that we experience here in Canada. And you can see some cases here where one party got more of the popular vote, so that the people, more of the people voted for that party, but the other party formed a majority government. And these are the kind of situations in Canada that actually lead to calls for electoral reform. So when I say it could be more skewed than first past the post, this is partly what I mean. Another thing you get with alternative vote in Australia, this probably looks like a news article from Canada. Um, you're, this uh, journalist and television host is basically saying, come on, let's get serious here. There's only about 30 ridings in Australia that even matter. Uh, the voters, the swing voters there are the ones that decide the election. Most of the vote, most of the seats are predictable, safe seats. And so all the, the money goes to target those swing ridings. And if that sounds familiar, that's because it's a winner take all system. So I'm going to come back to Alan Renwick, um, the director of the UK Constitution Unit, who wrote the alternative vote briefing paper for the 2011 referendum in the UK on the alternative vote. And what he said is alternative vote does not increase proportionality compared to first past the post. It can exaggerate the overrepresentation of the biggest party. It can exaggerate landslides. I'll show you what that looks like. So this is an election in Western Australia with the alternative vote from this year. And here you can see the Labour Party did quite well. Um, they got almost 60% of the popular vote, but that got them 90% of the seats. So you can see that how exactly what Alan Renwick's talking about, how it just took all the little party voters and the, the opposition vote just funneled it all into the big party until there's basically almost no representation for anybody else. So this is the kind of thing that can happen with first past the post and even possibly to a greater degree with alternative vote. So now we're going to look at third parties and smaller parties. And this is uh, 
this is important because sometimes people are so desperate for change and and trust me i feel that i really do um, that they think you know maybe if you shake up the voting system and we change it a bit and you know you're a third party or a smaller party when people get to rank their preferences then somehow you know optimistically that'll end up with more representation for third or smaller parties but unfortunately that's actually not supported by anything other than wishful thinking so Harold Jansen looked at the effect of the alternative vote in Alberta and Manitoba over the 30 years that it was used. And basically what he found is that alternative vote was associated with a greater number of parties running, but not a greater number of parties being elected. So there was no effect on in uh, Alberta or Manitoba on the number of parties being elected that was attributed to the alternative vote. So you can cast your vote for these other parties, but uh, they're not going to win. And here we can see um, important case study here from Australia. You can see that the Green Party of Australia is actually um, as strong or even stronger uh, than our Canadian Green Party. And they routinely now get over 10% of the vote and at times almost up to 12% of the vote. Yet in Australia, that delivers them one seat. And don't forget, they had lots of time to learn how the system works and run strong campaigns and all that kind of stuff, right? But alternative vote just basically delivers the same or worse than first past the post in terms of representation for smaller parties. So in the 2019 Australia election, the third parties, parties other than the big two, got 25% of first choice votes, um, but they only got 3% of those of the seats. So as Dennis Pilon would say, alternative vote just basically serves to entrench the superior position of the major parties even further. Um, it has the effect of funneling all the support back to the two big parties, but requires little in the way of political horse trading, in other words, compromises for them to get that support. Now we're going to talk about whether alternative vote could benefit one party more than another party. And this is really important in Canada. So you'll probably remember that in 2015, um, you know, when Justin Trudeau was preferring the alternative vote system, the ranked ballot, but not, you know, pretending that he was open minded and all that stuff, right? A bunch of political analysts and academics did simulations of what would, what would have happened federally if his system had been in place for the 2015 election. What effect would it have had? And here we can see from Eric Grenier, who's a CBC senior polls analyst, that instead of, the Liberals got 39.5% of the vote, which gave them with first past the post 54% of the seats, which gave them 100% of the power. So with that same uh, level of support, instead of 184 seats, they would have got 224 seats. It would have been a complete, uh, more than a more of a landslide than it already was. And Abacus Data did a study right after the 2015 election. Well, people's preferences still hadn't changed. It was right fresh, and they asked about 3,000 Canadians to rank their choices. So you know, to rank their preferences, just like an alternative vote, to see how an alternative vote election would have turned out. And they found the exact same thing, that the ranked ballot would have delivered the liberal 64% of the seats on a minority of the vote. And Byron Weber Becker, whom I've already referred to, used his modeling to look at the alternative vote. And he found the exact same thing, that it would have given the liberals a 20, almost a 24% seat bonus over their popular support. So this is at the federal level. So let's look at Ontario, right? Maybe things are different in Ontario. Um, but here we see Byron has done simulations for us going all the way back to 1987. And what he discovered is that if preferential ballot, uh, ranked, ranked ballot had been used in Ontario, uh, that the Liberals would have benefited from that system in every single election, but one uh, going back to 1987. And the one election where it didn't benefit them, it didn't hurt them either. Um, and you can see the benefit isn't huge, but the effect of it would have been the only minority government that we've had in the past 15, 20 years uh, would have been transformed into a liberal majority government. So one thing we often hear, and it's a 
100% valid, uh, not criticism, but observation that we often make ourselves as well. When you have a different voting system, people vote differently. How can you say, you know, how the results will turn out? Because, you know, people are just using this first past the post system. So here was an interesting study done in 2011. Um, it was a partnership between researchers at four different universities, and it was called the Ontario Three Votes Study. And what they did is they ran um, they advertised for people in, uh, on CBC, Toronto Star, and all this kind of stuff. And then they weighted the results so that it was reasonably accurate to the actual percentage of voters for different parties in the population. And what they did is they asked people to use three different systems in Ontario right when that Ontario election was going on and vote with three different systems. They explained how each system works. So they used a list PR system, a purely proportional system, which really isn't relevant for Canada. But anyway, it gives the idea of what people would do if they had a PR ballot where they knew every single vote would count. Um, they used the alternative vote system and the first past the post system. And so they, they put those incentives in front of people and saw what they would actually do. And what the result was is that fewer people were going to pick the Liberals as their first choice, but the Liberals would get lots more seats. So uh, you see that, you know, the vote for the, the Liberal share of the, the first choice vote went down. They picked up all those votes on the second choice preferences, which were either strategic, very likely, um, or sincere. And the, it gave them even more seats. And the conclusion of their research was that the transformation of votes into seats strongly advantages the Liberals. They do better than first past the post, now getting a majority government. The other thing they found, which is like sort of a side note in their research, but I find it uh, very important, is they found that the alternative vote lowered the number of effective parties. So this means, you know, this is like a political science measurement uh, of the number of parties that have really have any influence uh, in in the legislature. And what they found is that it lowered the number of effective parties, which means it brought us slightly closer to a two party system. So this is sort of the, a bit of a frightening thing about how alternative vote can work. So now I want to talk about civility and cooperation, because so far, this is the line that the Ontario Liberals are using. Uh, you know, they're going to make elections less polarizing. They, they want to collaborate with other parties and, you know, make things more cooperative and, you know, more pleasant for all of us, whatever. OK, so the first thing to understand is why did Australia, because we've got now 110 years of looking at whether it makes things more cooperative. Why did Australia adopt the alternative vote? Well, it wasn't because a bunch of citizen groups and politicians sat down and designed a great electoral system. It was because basically there was a, a right wing, uh, the right wing uh, prime minister, Billy Hughes at the time was concerned there were two right wing parties, they were splitting the vote and allowing the Labour Party to win. And that's why they brought in alternative vote to benefit themselves. And there isn't really any history you'll find telling you otherwise. This is a little cartoon from 1915. I found a Wikipedia. It's actually a little animation. His hat goes up and down. What does Billy Hughes have under his hat? So of course, I think alternative vote, right? So I want to come back to this idea of will it make politics more collaborative and cooperative, like Stephen Del Duca is saying. So if it drives politics more towards a two party system, and if it increases the number of false majorities and decreases the number of minority governments where parties have to cooperate, how are they going to get more cooperative? If you have a system that never gives them any practice at having to cooperate in the legislature, how is it going to make politics more cooperative? It's, it's, it's a bit of a puzzler for me. So uh, Dennis Pilon, in commenting on how the alternative vote has affected Australia, he said, it has led to some collaboration between the two right-wing parties who introduced it, uh, but no collaboration with anybody else. What we've seen in Australia is it's tended to entrench the divide between the two sides rather than overcoming it. And here we have Alan Renwick from the UK Constitution Unit in his briefing paper on the alternative vote saying there's no reason to expect a move towards civility. In Australia, each of the two parties urges their supporters to rank the other party last. The main political battle remains just as hostile as under first past the post. That's his words, hostile and combative. And here's an interesting paper that was done on exactly this topic to researchers looking at um, is alternative vote actually helping 
make the hostility and adversarial nature of Australian politics worse. And they concluded that, yes, it is. They said AV with its tendency to squash uprising and moderate political movements emboldens and exacerbates an, an adversarial political culture. So basically, they concluded that it rewards all the behavior that we don't want, um, so which is sort of the opposite of what you're probably going to start hearing um, on social media from the Ontario Liberal Party. And here, uh, you know, it doesn't take much looking on Google to find things like this. Mark Evans from the University of Canberra Institute for Governance and Public Policy Analysis. He is head of a project called Democracy 2025, basically trying to um, save democracy in Australia, <laughs> improve it, bring it back from its toxic state that it's in. And he says that uh, most Australians are very clear they don't like what's on display in politics. And in 2016, he was so alarmed, a survey had showed that if current trends continue, less than 10% of Australians will trust their politicians and their political institutions. Now, it's not that people in Australia are sitting around saying, and this is because we have the ranked ballot, it's so bad. I'm not really, I don't really think they're making that connection. What I'm saying is that when it drives, when it, when you have a winner take all system that drives things into a two party divide, this is what you get. And that's the politics that flows out of it. And you can see the level of satisfaction with democracy in Australia is going down, down, down to the point where in 2019, the Australian election study found that only 12% of people think that the government is run for all the people and most of them think it's run for a few big interests. So if AV is putting power back in the hands of voters, somehow it's not really apparent how that's happening. And to give you a few concrete examples, this is from, I don't know, five or six years ago here, where the leader of the Liberal Party, which is the Conservative conservatives in Australia, don't be fooled by the names, um, we, you know, was speaking at an anti-carbon tax rally in front of a sign that said these things you can see on the screen, which I don't really need to repeat. That's how, uh, how much the second choices are making them more collaborative in case you're missing it, which I am. Um, and you can see here from Alan Renwick's briefing paper, he's quoting uh, the leader of the Conservative Party saying that the leader of the Liberal Party is like Richard Nixon, she's delusional, to which she responds, he's a hollow, bitter man with no judgment, who never gets the big calls right. So this is the kind of atmosphere they have going on in their parliament. And in uh, this here, I just picked from May 2021, right? You think it's... it's uh, pandemic, they should be all working together here, but no, um, the Speaker of the House is trying to get this zoo under control, and the opposition MP is arguing with the Speaker and telling the Speaker, well, you know, the government keeps bashing us, so we're going to keep bashing them. In case you think maybe somebody was just having a bad day, there's a great study of this over 100 years in Australia. Um, on the Parliament of Australia website, you can find this. And here you will find that between 1994 and 2016, the MPs were booted out of the chamber 1,423 times, where the speaker actually had to ask them to leave the chamber because they were so ill-behaved and, you know, not, not listening, not sitting down, not being quiet, being disrespectful, and that this kind of behavior um, in a two years alone, at one point, the speaker had to eject three MPs per day. And despite the public being pretty much disgusted with this, uh, the researchers concluded that this kind of behavior, adversarial behavior is on the rise. So if the ranked ballot is helping it, it's not apparent how that's helping it or how it's giving voters more power to um, diminish this kind of behavior. So now I want to talk about alternative vote and strategic voting. And so this is something I haven't yet heard from Stephen Del Duca, but I have no doubt it's coming. Um, because I remember hearing Justin Trudeau say this to a group of students uh, at an event back in 2016. He was like, it's something I'm paraphrasing here. It was something to the effect of, oh, you know, I know some more people would like to vote green and look with, uh, with you know, alternative vote. You can, you can do that. Isn't that great? Okay. So here with uh, First Past the Post, this is the kind of strategic voting cam campaigns that we get where, you know, the parties and allies tell you, you can't vote for what you want, you must vote for the other, you must vote for how we tell you or the bad thing is going to happen. And plus, you know, you want to help us get more power, right? So the thing to understand about all winner take all systems, and I really want to 
emphasize this. When you have a winner-take-all system and the big parties know it's a winner-take-all system, they will behave accordingly. They will want to demonize the opponents. They will want to drive more votes into their baskets. And the whole goal is to get more power. So if anybody thinks that just adding a one, two, three to a ballot is going to change the political calculations of parties in a winner take all system, it's it's not. It just changes what it looks like. And here I'm going to show you what strategic voting look for the same reasons uh, looks like in Australia. So instead of the parties telling you uh, that you must vote for uh, X, Y, and Z, or the, or the bad thing you don't want will happen, the parties make preference deals before the election. So, you know, they go in a back room and decide who, who they're going to tell you to vote for to defeat the other guy and get more power for themselves. This is an institutionalized part of the Australian system. And this is from the BBC. It says the quest for a majority government is where the Australian tradition of the how to vote cards comes in, a method of tactical voting decided by the party leaders. Doesn't this sound great? So here you can see how this works. So here we have a conservative candidate and this is the how to vote card you'll get. And you'll get these in the mail and you'll get them handed out to you as you're going up to the polling station um, by party volunteers. And here they're telling you how to uh, maximize the votes for their big party and, um, and minimize the chances of the other big party uh, getting any votes. So here you're to rank this guy, the conservative first, and then you'll rank the small right wing populist party second. And then the this fellow's main opponents in that riding are the Labour and the Greens, and you are to rank them last. And here you have a how to vote card from the Green Party. And here they're telling you to rank Kathy first. And then who do you rank second? Well, of course, you rank the Labour Party second right? Because that's where the, their vote is really going to go. And here you can see a picture I grabbed off the internet of uh, volunteers standing. They have to stand a certain distance away when they hand you out your how to vote card as you go to the polls. So if you think this thing or something like it won't develop in Canada with alternative vote, I think that's naive because parties do what they need to do to direct the votes where they need them to go. So in PEI in 2016, they had a plebiscite on proportional representation. And there were actually, for those that didn't follow it, there were five systems on the ballot and it was a ranked ballot. And there was two proportional systems and three winner take all systems on that ballot in PEI. And one of them was alternative vote. And so Anna Keenan, who is a PR campaigner who comes from Australia, did a little video, which was excellent. And basically she said, have you ever felt like you had to vote strategically? Now, in this case, sure, ranked ballot can help. It can help you feel better when you vote. The only problem is, unless the party that you like is the most popular party in the riding, they're going to ignore your first preference vote entirely. Your first preference really doesn't matter at all. And this is from somebody who comes from Australia and has voted in this system. So as one of Australia's main commentators pointed out, Anthony Green, basically what happens is that almost every vote that the Labour Party, which is like our Liberals, lose to the Green Party, comes right back to the Labour Party as a preference. And so then as Anna says, you know, you feel better for like five minutes or whatever it is while you're marking your true first choice, but then the results are almost exactly the same as first past the post. You still get disproportionate majorities, ineffective oppositions, and costly swings from left to right every few elections. Now it can go the other way too. So in the Australia at the national parliament level, you have to rank all your choices. It's mandatory. You have to number them all. But what happens when it's not mandatory? So there's a couple of states in Australia where it's optional. Um, you can just rank one or two or how many, three, four, however many you want. Okay, so when this was brought in, the parties at first were doing the how to vote cards. You know, they were doing the same thing I just described to you. But after a couple of elections, they figured out that they, what they'd really like is just for people to use it just like first past the post, because that works better for them to get their false majority government. So over a period of years, the different parties were putting, um, you know, ridiculous, dishonest claims and basically telling their supporters not to bother ranking anybody just to put a one, just mark one. And so you can see here over about 20 years, what happened in Queensland uh, is that in 1992, in the optional 
rank as few or as many as you want came in, uh, about 23% of people were just marking one choice. But by 2012, that had gone up to 70% of people were listening to these messages from the, their parties and just marking one preference. So whether it goes one way or the other in Canada, either way, you're getting parties uh, telling you how to vote based on fear-based messages to deliver more of the votes to the two big parties. You're just getting a different version of it. So I want to talk a little bit about something that's really important to a lot of people, and that is policy lurch. So a lot of you probably already know what policy lurch is. So policy lurch is when there's an abrupt change in policy, when one government replaces the other. And this is a problem with winner take all voting systems that's been identified since the 1970s. Um, so, you know, you have a left wing or center sort of government, and then they're, they're out and then all, you know, like Jason Kenney said in Alberta, you know, I'm going to spend the first 100 days undoing all of Rachel Not Notley's policies. That's, this is what I'm talking about. So we see this quite a bit in Australia. So an example of it here is, and there's more to the political story, but I'm going to keep it a little bit more simple here. Um, in about 2011, the Australian Labour Party, that's like our liberals, right, um, decided they were going to bring in a carbon tax. Okay, so here they are announcing their carbon tax and saying we're going to convince voters this is a great idea, we're going to see how well it works, yada yada boo. Now, from the history that you can read online, what happened was that they did have a negotiation with the Conservatives that, that um, called the Liberals. Uh, anyway, they did have a negotiation and the Conservative Party basically decided uh, that they were not going to go along with this because a they because it's a big tent party and don't forget winner take all systems force everybody into a big tent party. So in the big tent party were a bunch of climate change denialists and there were a bunch of people that just love winner take all systems and wanted to use this to defeat the Labour Party, use it as a wedge issue to defeat the Labour Party. So the Labour Party couldn't get bipartisan consensus on the carbon tax, they decided to bring it in anyway. And the next election, the Conservatives ran on, we'll immediately legislate to scrap the carbon tax. This must sort of look kind of familiar for those of you in Ontario. So here's what happened. You can see in 2012, the Labour Party brought in the carbon tax, where I've circled it there. And over the course of two years, emissions in Australia fell uh, more than they had in 24 years. And then the Conservatives, uh, the Liberal National coalition, the Conservatives won power, they repealed the carbon tax, and since then the emissions in Australia have been continuing to increase, whereas today Australia is ranked last of 60 countries in its policy response to the climate crisis. This is a recent article. And here you can see the Climate Change Performance Index 2022 that just came out, and red is very low for in terms of uh, climate performance, and here you can see Canada, the US, and Australia, the winner take all countries doing very, very badly. And you can see here we are down way down at the bottom of the pack, us and the US and Australia. And you can see that Australia is actually the only country that they ranked zero for their climate policy. So that's what the, the flip flop um, toxic politics has delivered in Australia on climate. Uh, so this is from a climate campaigner from the Clean Energy Council in Australia, basically he described what happened. He said a sensible and accepted approach is now so difficult governments either aren't prepared to go there or it's done in such a way that there's such a narrow field of options that it's almost pointless. And this I found rather striking from an article on NBC about a year after the Australian wildfires somebody saying, uh, I feel ashamed of our country, it's allowed some sort of short term cynical politics to prevent proper climate action. Now, please be understand, I'm not saying this is going to happen in Canada. I'm just saying, as we think of what kind of voting system that we need to tackle all the different challenges ahead of us, is this the kind of system we want? Is it a, do we want a winner take all system? Or do we want a system that promotes parties working together, um, and able to look at more long term uh, solutions rather than short term political campaigns. Last one, guys. Uh, so alternative vote, is it a step towards PR? So again, let me let me uh, reiterate that I feel the pain of how much we need change and the call from some people that any change has got to be better than no change. <laughs> so and that some of that is couched in language that suggests that once we get changed and somehow voters will get used to change and somehow that's going to lead to more change and it's a really nice theory but unfortunately it's not really supported by anything 
So Dennis Pilon, as I said, who spent his entire career looking at why countries change, when they change, how they change, said that many reformers believe that alternative vote would precede the introduction of PRSTV. So they believe that if you got the winner take all ranked ballot, somehow that was going to lead to the proportional ranked ballot down the road because you know they both have numbers or whatever. Okay, so he says, unfortunately, this never occurred in any jurisdiction. And the reason for that are simple politics, power. Now, this was very frustrating to reformers. They had difficulty giving up their assumptions about how things would happen. And here he's talking about uh, the experience of reformers that helped bring in the alternative vote in the Western provinces about 100 years, 80 to 100 years ago. And here I just picked this off Twitter. Um, somebody saying we've used ranked choice voting, uh, by which he means alternative vote in Australia for more than a century. That's a pretty slow road to PR. So just to sum up here, uh, in terms of proportionality, AV is going to be the same, sometimes worse than first past the post. In terms of representation for third or small party voters, the same or worse in terms of benefiting one party over the other. In Australia, it systematically benefits the Conservatives. Here in Canada, it would probably systematically benefit the Liberals. There's been research going back to 1980, looking at different elections that have found the same thing. Um, in terms of adversarial politics, uh, no, it doesn't help. It may, as Alan Renwick said, it may help at the fringes. So that's what he said at the at the oh at the margins. He said it may help at the margins. You know, so there may be some ridings where a couple of parties that probably aren't going to win anyway are a little bit nicer to each other. But in terms of the overall tone, no. Um, strategic voting campaigns just change. They become more institutionalized and party driven, and it does not increase our chances of moving to PR based on anything that we've ever seen in the world. So Fair Vote Canada looks at alternative vote as a dead end, and that's why. Uh, that's why really the what the Liberals are doing uh, in Ontario, which I very much look at as a trial balloon for all other levels, particularly the federal level, uh, is something that we need to push back against. And so we did a poll uh, a couple of weeks ago asking people in Ontario what they think about one party ramming through their preferred system and found that people aren't a really a big fan of that. So in terms of talking to people, even if they don't understand voting systems, this is a way that you can talk to people about the problem of what's happening in Ontario. And we are calling for a citizens assembly on electoral reform and happy to talk about that more in the question and answer. And now I'm going to bring back Tony to answer lots of your questions. And thank you, thank you, thank you, everybody, for your patience to sit through that. I really appreciate it. Thanks so much, Anita. That's uh, an, an amazing overview of this issue. And uh, just before I get started, I, I'll acknowledge that uh, I'm speaking to you from the uh, lands of the Coast Salish people. Um, the Squamish, Tsleil-Waututh, and Musqueam uh, people of the West Coast. Um, so we, we have a number of questions, and uh, I, I'm sorry to turn this first one back to you, but I, I think since you live in Ontario, you, you will <laughs> oh, actually no. have more insight into it. But it's uh, it's from John Legg, and he says, uh, please explain why the Liberal head of his party is not bluffing when he threatens to resign if he doesn't get his motion through. <laughs> why he's not bluffing? No. I, you know, I don't know. I can't understand. I can't pretend to understand what goes on in the liberal, the liberal brain trusts there, John. Yeah, I mean, he's really backed himself into a corner by by saying, I mean, and according to him, this is how he makes himself look more trustworthy. Their their perception of the problem is that the other that the liberal, the uh, federal liberals promised it didn't follow through. Therefore, uh, they are going to promise and he will guarantee that they follow through or he'll step down. Now, of course, a lot of things could happen in, in Ontario, okay? So uh, the first of all, the Liberal Party might not win the election. I mean, before you totally uh, say, oh, well, it's impossible, they're not going to win the election. You have to realize they've won a lot of elections in Ontario, so it is a real danger. But if they don't win the election, if Doug Ford wins the election, obviously this point becomes uh, irrelevant. Okay, so that could happen. They could end up in a minority situation where they just can't bring in their preferred system. That could actually end up worse for us um, in terms of what plays out. And I can talk about that more later. So yeah, there's certainly wiggle room for him not to resign. 
what Fairvote Canada would like to see happen is we need to, we need Stephen Del Duca to shift. And let me explain what I'm what I'm saying. He has said that he will force through alternative vote, and then he'll have a citizens assembly. I hope everybody's following me how absurd this is. Okay, so first you bring in your preferred system, which will probably lock this in place for however long, and then you'll have a citizens assembly on topics yet not yet decided about which you'll do who knows other than we'll we'll take that under advisement so what we need is him to reverse the order of his plan <laughs> and to say you know what we've heard a lot of pushback and we really want to hear the voices of ontarians and we want a better process so we're going to have the citizens assembly first that's what we need to happen and he can still do that while keeping his pledge that he's serious about electoral reform and I think the the other part of that is that because he has he's putting his reputation on the line at this point, I think it means that we really, as as electoral reformers, have to take uh, what is effectively a threat seriously. It means mm -hmm. that he he is explicitly declaring his intention in a way that Justin Trudeau did not. Uh, that if he is elected, he will do this in a way that will cement power for his party, and in or is is extremely likely to. It's it's. Uh, a move that is in his party's self-interest. And I think electoral reformers have to recognize, uh, you know, based on comments that Dennis Pilon has made, this is all about power. There's a reason why he's making this promise and it's not because he wants to fundamentally improve democracy in Canada. Um, so- Other questions, Tony? <laughs> Yeah, so there are uh, there are a number of uh, other questions. Have studies been done? Uh, so Greg Hill asks, have studies been done comparing Australian style AV, where you have to rank all the choices, and uh, AV where you don't, and the latter is what's advocated in the U.S. So uh, just before I answer that question in in uh, you know more directly, I do want to say that um, there there is a, a big distinction, I think, in discussions of the alternative vote or also known as instant runoff voting um, uh, between provincial and national level assemblies where there is a party structure and in cities at the municipal level. Um, so the alternative vote is actually, or instant runoff voting, is actually used quite widely uh, throughout the US. There, there are dozens of cities uh, that use it in various ways but typically in places where there are not party structures. And so it's actually really important to understand how the same voting system plays out differently when there are party labels attached and, and not. And often in the municipal uh, setting, um, well, yeah, so, so I think that, that's just a big difference. What you end up with in municipal settings are lots of candidates running for single seats. So in in the you know in the Canadian system or in the Australian system, you you typically have uh, you know a handful of people running four or five six people, whereas in municipal office you can have uh, you know a dozen or twenty people running, and they're not running with the same sort of electoral machinery behind them. So uh, and and really not uh, necessarily coordinated across all the different uh, wards and things. So we have to be very very careful when we look at literature that. Um, uh, surveys what's happening in uh, in Australia versus what's happening in the in in cities. So to go back to Greg's question about um, uh, there there are differences in rules in different places about whether you in order to take advantage of uh, you know a, a ranked ballot whether you are allowed to rank just a single person or or a handful or whether you're obligated to rank everybody. Um, so. Uh, the, yeah, certainly in Australia, the um, in many of the places where alternative vote is used at, at some of the state levels, um, there are requirements to to either do an above the line vote or where you just choose a, a ranking that has been pre-selected by uh, by a party, and uh, or whether uh, if you want to vote below the line you are sometimes obligated to rank every single candidate on the ballot. And what this means in effect is if there are you know, 20 people below the line, you as a voter have to make these 20 decisions in order to, you know, maybe, maybe you really only want to express an opinion about the relative merits of the top two or three, 
Um, and then you don't know enough about anybody further down the list. So you really don't want to do it and you kind of randomly do that. It's a strong, um, uh, it strongly dissuades you from doing that. And so the, the net effect when you have this requirement to rank everybody is uh, to push you towards accepting a party ordered list. And that goes back to uh, all the discussion that Anita had about how uh, basically the, uh, you know, the, the, the decision to have a, an alternative vote system in the first place is all about uh, you know, party political considerations. And so, um, yeah, I mean, if, if I were to come down on it, you know, it, and, and I don't want us to go down this path, but if we, if we ever did, I certainly wouldn't want the requirement that you have to list everybody. So that's, uh, what Anita, a, you yeah, one of the more? things um, that uh, Dennis Pilon pointed out in Harold Jansen's work, the fellow that the academic that did the research on the 30 years we used in Canada, is basically in the alternative vote ridings, by the end, a majority of people were even bothering to rank anybody, they were just putting one. So if it was giving voters, I mean, yeah. I'm, I'm putting this in the context of what I'm hearing from the Ontario Liberal Party who's saying that it's putting power back in the hands of voters to give them more of what they want and encourage good behavior. Well, if it's so powerful, uh, <laughs> people, when we had it in, we, when we had it, people weren't even using it. And I think it's probably because not just what Tony says, where there's a lot of people that you have to rank, but probably because they, people quickly figured out that it really wasn't making much of a difference in terms of giving voters more power or more diverse representation. It was just producing almost the same results as first past the post, except for a few swing ridings where the two parties uh, duke it out. Yeah. Um, so uh, here's a question that actually, uh, that, that again, I'm, I'll, I'll punt back to you because you're in Ontario, but uh, it, it's from uh, Nancy Slofstra who says, how do I let the Ontario Liberal government know in a way that will make an impact that I don't want AV uh, even though I do want to vote liberal in order to make sure that Ford is ousted. <laughs> <laughs> so how do you how do you uh, oh, how do you express so opposition hard. to a policy by voting for somebody who advocates that policy? <laughs> I mean, and yeah, I mean that and that is going to be part of the liberal party sales pitch, right? They they're not doing it at this time by accident. You know, yeah. so you remember when Justin Trudeau sold people on electoral reform when Stephen Harper was in, right? So you're going to be hearing, well, you know, we were promised to bring in a system where, you know, you'll never have to deal with the people like Doug Ford again, which of course is, is not true. But anyway, uh, you know, it's, it's really difficult for me. I think that I, I wouldn't be telling them, well, I'm going to vote for you anyway. Um, because if you uh, instantly they stop listening then okay yeah. so I think they need to hear that this promise is going to cost them okay and when you communicate mm -hmm. with the Ontario Liberal Party on this I would not be communicating at the level that I'm communicating to you guys folks people on this sorry on this webinar okay I would be communicating like on voting systems okay as soon as you say well there's proportional and then there's something called alternative vote and all this stuff they instantly know you're one of the electoral reform geeks okay that's not how you want to talk to them you want to say this this uh proposal you have to bring in a system that from what I can see would benefit you is making you look untrustworthy it's making you look arrogant. It's it's making you look like this is one of the reasons that uh, people booted the Ontario Liberals out of power after so long in 2018. This kind of we're not listening. We're going to do it our way or the highway. Uh, we just want to entrench our own power and help our friends. You know, all those things that help kill the big parties. They don't want their voting system promise to be attached to those kind of things. So if you can say to them, this is going to cost you votes, not based on voting system geeks, but based on that perception, then they may start listing. Yeah, absolutely. That makes <laughs> terrific sense. Um, yeah, I think the uh, we we have to uh, help the Ontario Liberals understand that we have seen this story play out before. That the 2015 election was uh, one in which uh, Trudeau really quite cynically manipulated all the people who were looking for change and uh, ended up collecting power on the basis of that of that electoral appeal and then shafted us all afterwards. So um, yeah. Uh, Diane Hollingdale asks, uh, why does AV favor the Liberals rather than the Conservatives in Ontario? 
Um, and I think, yeah, that's, that's an excellent question. Of course, uh, provincial um, politics can differ from federal politics. And again, I'm out here on the West Coast, so I'm not going to weigh in too heavily on that. Uh, but I, uh, and I don't actually know if I've seen explicit polling about second preferences in Ontario. Um, when I worked with Byron, we were working at a, at a federal level and we were um, basing our estimates of uh, voters sort of second preferences on national level polls. I think in particular, we based it on an ECOS poll. Um, these polls come out pretty routinely. They're, they're now actually uh, being asked quite regularly now that uh, uh, there have been a number of electoral reform movements over the, in, in different provinces over the last couple of decades. So it's actually encouraging that in the, in the polling level, these pollsters are asking, well, you know, who you'd like to vote for this party or, you know, who, who would you vote for if you were forced to go somewhere else? Um, so we do know a little bit more about that. I think the basic answer is, is that uh, fundamentally the alternative, but whenever you rank, you, um, you, you have your, your, first preference and then your next preference. So if you're out on the wings, either on the right wing or the left wing, and that's where your, your first preference is, your next preference, gen, I mean, often there's there's nobody, you know, too much more extreme that you're going to vote for. Uh, so you tend to vote more centrally. And so votes will tend to converge on whichever party is perceived to be the most centrist. And so I think in Canada's political spectrum, the Liberals in Ontario and federally uh, are perceived to be the most centrist party, and that's probably why uh, that's going to happen. The, the Liberals will get the second choice votes from left and right. I mean, right. you can see that, you know, um, they'll also get strategic with the same strategic votes that they get now. So people are yeah. happy to throw away their first choice preference on, you know, the party they know has no chance in their riding, um, and then vote Liberal second, um, yeah. you know, to stop the Conservatives. And that's yeah. what they're counting on. It just basically institutionalizes that. Yeah, for sure. Um, there was a question by uh, Erwin Dreesen who says, uh, the value of simulations is inherently limited because under a different voting system, people's behavior will change. Comment? <laughs> so yes, for sure. And I think uh, the, uh, the study that Anita put up um, by Andre Blay on the three voting systems in Ontario is probably the cleanest example we have of that. So in the simulations that uh, Byron and I did, um, we really were looking at, uh, you know, second, uh, second party preference data uh, and trying to infer how people might vote. But of course, what we saw in that was they were actually, the participants were actually presented with different ballots uh, that would be offered under different voting systems. And so we really saw how people's behavior would change. And the most striking thing we saw there was that the, the liberal support under first past the post, I forget the exact number, I think it was 37% or something like that. And then it dropped by four or 5%. And what that is largely reflect uh, under the alternative vote. And so what that's reflecting is the fact that uh, under first past the post, because you only have the one choice, you may not actually support the liberals as your first choice. You support somebody else. But with the alternative vote, you feel free to express that. So, you know, they voted for the NDP or the Greens or whoever. And, uh, but as we saw in the end, uh, all of those votes came back because they probably would have voted <laughs> for the liberals as their second preference. So the liberals captured it again. So we would under the alternative vote see a little more clearly what people's uh, true preferences are. And in that respect, you know, may, maybe we start to see that the, the amount of support that the winning party gets is, uh, is vastly overstated. But even worse than they, they get back not only the, the votes they would have gotten under first past the post, but they get the extra votes that are currently just, you know, completely uh, um, well, ignored, they get not just the votes, but they get the extra seats that they wouldn't have gotten under first past the post. And so on even less, uh, you know, true voting support, you get more uh, seats in the end. So it's, uh, it's really, um, 
uh, force that drives us towards eliminating smaller players. It, it drives us towards this two-party system. Uh, Duverger's law says that these kinds of winner-take-all systems drive political systems towards uh, having two primary parties that are duking it out over the middle. And uh, so, so that's really what's just, going on there. Just a comment on simulations. So of course yeah. people, you know, I mean, there's studies going back to 1980 of people finding the same thing that alternative vote would very likely in Canada benefit the liberals because there are more parties on the left and all those votes get funneled into them. But I wouldn't send like, you know, people a bunch of simulations and say here look at this right people can use their common sense this is something that's been quite interesting since justin trudeau tried to push this on a mildly uh in 2016 uh, not with the force of the whole party and their machine behind him um is that people were instantly able to apply their common sense they were like mm -hmm. why are the liberals so in favor of this system and not willing to look at, you know, asking uh, citizens assembly or some experts to look at this. And then people are like, oh, they're the second choice of people on the left and people on the right. You don't need to look at 30 years of simulations and argue about the value of simulations to use your common sense. And you can see that in the media as well. The media is uh, rarely our friend in the PR movement, but on this one, they're our friend. Um, they pick, they've picked up this liberal self-interest idea and they're running with it. Now, over the long term, would this benefit the liberals? It's, it's really hard to say. Over the long term, it's benefited the conservatives in Australia because they have the two conservative parties. And so they've been able to funnel more of the vote. So about 64% of the governments in Australia are conservative majority, false majority governments. And here we see in Canada, it may be the opposite you know but it also either whether it benefits the liberals in the long run or whether the conservatives eventually figure out how to use the system the most consistent thing that i can say for 100 percent sure certain guaranteed is it's not proportional it shuts out small parties and it's possibly going to drive us closer to a two-party system and it institutionalizes strategic voting so regardless of whether it who it helps if you don't want those things you don't want alternative vote and if you want to have a chance to change to a more proportional system we cannot let alternative vote come in in canada's most populated province it would set a horrible precedent and the the main the main reason that it concerns me so much is once you concentrate power more with mm -hmm. two big parties they're even less likely to give it up yeah. Okay, so that's what we don't want to do. So when you look at the research on how on when do countries move towards proportional representation, the research shows that the more effective parties you have in Parliament, the closer you are to getting PR, because the big parties will discover that the first past the post system isn't working for them anymore. Okay, that's sort of what started happening in 2011. But if you go the opposite direction and start concentrating power in most of the seats back in the two big parties, you are going to be farther away from ever winning PR. So we will be farther away than we are right now. Yeah, absolutely. And I think uh, Helen Forsey asks a, a similar question and, and really wants us to uh, explain, explain again why AV cannot be seen as in any way a step forward um, uh, and speaking exactly about this uh, entrenching position. I mean, once uh, it, over the last, you know, I mean, since Confederation, uh, there's been a steady shift away from uh, two party dominance. So the emergence of the CCF early in the 20th century, and, and then the, the further emergence of, you know, the Bloc Québécois and the, the Green Party, and, um, you know, potentially the emergence of the People's Party, uh, the, the vote share of the two major parties has consistently been going down uh, with time. It, it's happening in the UK as well. I think we are uh, we are moving in, towards a more pluralistic society. We are increasingly recognizing that uh, that the set of perspectives in society cannot be adequately captured uh, with two primary points of view. Um, and I think this really does threaten the the largest parties. They they want hegemony. They want they want that central power. Um, you know, we saw Gerald Butts. Uh, uh, just lauding the efficiency of the liberal data machine that uh, brought them within 16,000 votes of a majority government. Had, had they had 
you know, another, I don't know, another week, another, uh, another, you know, half million dollars of donations, you know, maybe they could have uh, turned just a few more voters and still on 30, you know, small fraction of uh, the vote, um, taken majority power, and they would be perfectly happy with that. Uh, and so AV is, in my view, a, a, a force that really drives towards that two party dominance. And that's why it's so critical for us now to not allow it to become entrenched in, you know, the largest province in Canada. So thanks very much for your question, Helen. That's really great. I, I want to just uh, address something that I, I think might be coming up in the chat. I'm not really sure. And that's the difference between a, a ranked ballot system uh, that's proportional and a ranked ballot system that's majoritarian. OK, so if everybody will just bear with me like for one one more slide <laughs> just in case this this uh, thing came up hold on share a slide here uh, watch that I watch me don't have it but I know I have it ah okay oh good there it is okay so what I want to I hope everybody can see this so just for those of you who are new um, so proportional systems can use ranked a ranked ballot. Okay, a ra ranked ballot is not really a system. It's just that we've lost that communication war with the politicians and the media. When they say ranked ballot, they mean the winner take all one. Um, so it's really hard to wrest back the language from them. Uh, but ranked ballots can be part of a proportional system. Ranked ballots on their own are not a bad thing. Uh, many people, including PR, many PR supporters like ranked ballots. It's, it's nice to build to have a full range of being able to mark all your choices, okay? But what makes the difference between what kind of a system is, is what is it designed to do? And what are the outcomes of it? And here you can see two elections that occurred in Australia this year um, at the state or territory level in the contrast. So here you can see Western Australia, which uses alternative vote. And you can see, like I showed in my presentation, the massive, how all the party votes basically went funneled right into the Labour Party for a massive majority government with almost no representation for others and then you can he see here over in Tasmania where they use single transferable vote okay so PRSTV proportional representation by the single transferable vote the system recommended by the BC Citizens Assembly um, and you can see here that voters again went to the polls ranked their choices and what they got was almost completely proportional as proportional as you'd get as anything any PR system in Canada, and yet both used a ranked ballot. So it's not the ranked ballot that's the problem, it's the type of system um, that it's used in. And just while we're on this particular slide, and just to really drive that point home, it's the multi-member nature of the single transferable vote that delivers the, the broadly inclusive and representational results. So it's really multi-member versus single member. That's uh, and, and in the Charter Challenge, we've got uh, uh, one of our expert witnesses, John Kerry, uh, just drives that point home that he says the fundamental distinction between voting systems is whether you've got multiple members representing a particular geographical area or a single member. And a single member is a winner take all. It's highly disproportional. It, it's, uh, it's exclusive and a multi-member um, system, whether it's uh, multi multiple members in uh, one tier or you know some some combination two tier systems uh, allows for the expression and the representation the representation and the expression of voice of voters with different political perspectives. So the ranked ballot is a, a design element that can be used in combination with both single member and multi member designs. So what we're really against here is uh, the the idea that by continuing with a single member. Uh, system, even if we add a ranked ballot to it, it makes it better. That's that's what we're disputing. So just to sort of try to put it even simpler language than Tony said, sure. for anybody who has no idea what's multi-member, what's he talking about in case there's somebody Sorry. that doesn't know. Um, so yeah. the, I, the problem with winner-take-all systems is that you exclusively elect one member. So yeah. can one person represent all the political points of view in your community whoever they are can they can they can they vote five different ways can they represent the diversity of where you live 
And th but that's what winner take all systems do. They break everything down into a one winner takes it all contest. What proportional yeah. systems do is they allow you to elect a local team. So this is how single transferable vote that you're seeing on the right hand side here in Tasmania works. So people are electing a, a team of local MPs. OK, mm -hmm. in, in Tasmania's case, they're electing a five member team. So they're ranking their choices, just like an alternative vote. But instead of one person winning, you'll get a local team of MPs that reflect the diversity of how people voted in that community. And that's the difference between um, proportional and non-proportional systems. Yeah. And I think uh, Barry Darby asked a, a question similar to this, was, was asking us to clarify the distinction between the alternative vote and a ranked ballot. And uh, yeah, there, there was um, back in the first uh, BCSTV referendum, um, there was a, a sort of um, uh, illustration that was going around and it was saying, you know, it, it's, it's basically like, uh, you know, imagine you're at, at um, an elementary school and you're trying to pick teams for sports day and you know you you have to come up with four teams and there are like you know eight uh, uh people who volunteer to be captains of the teams and then all the kids go and start swarming around the you know the captain that they want to have and uh what you do is as, as soon as the you, you see the the captain with the fewest kids around them you, you reject that captain and then those kids have to go and find somebody else and you stop when you've got four teams. Well, the you know the alternative vote is just where you force everybody to end up on one team. And if you want diversity, if you want representation of all the different perspectives there, you have to stop before you get down to one person. Both of those are sort of instant runoff kinds of elections, but it's multi-member or single member. That's the that's the difference. So I've got a couple of questions here, just looking at what's been upvoted. Um, Sure. So, somebody's asking, how would people sell to Ford and allies that they would look good by championing a citizens assembly? <sighs> I, um, I'm, I'm not aware of any way to make the conservatives interested in anything other than first past the post. I think that um, as Stephen Del Duca gets more serious of pushing alternative vote, the conservatives will push back against it like they did federally and they will push back hard. Um, because this is for them an existential crisis issue. Uh, the fact that they would probably lose, at least in the short term, huge vote share um, by the adoption of the alternative vote, but that doesn't make them an ally because what they really want is to keep first past the post. So I'm not too sure that we can, uh, how much support we can count on for from the Conservatives for a Citizens Assembly. I would really, um, I mean, go for it and try. I mean, it'd be great. <laughs> but I would really focus on the Ontario Liberal Party and having them hear that their leader um, will receive a lot more support uh, if they are promising a process that people that is open minded, evidence based, nonpartisan, and that people can trust, along with his promise to deliver electoral reform. Um, but the Citizens Assembly needs to come first. And we're having another question here about we've had so sorry, many. Sorry, can I, Go ahead. Can I just answer uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, something there? So one um, Professor Royce Coop at the University of Manitoba oh, just yeah. published a really interesting article this last week or so uh, about the case for why and he's talking about the federal conservatives in particular, but you know why they should be starting to think more seriously about electoral reform. Says you know there there are really no reasons for them not to, and plenty of reasons for them too. And I just wanted to point out that. Uh, we should always keep in mind the distinction between the federal landscape and the provincial. So even if a provincial party is currently not motivated to do something, uh, they might be motivated at the federal level. And so that may give us an opportunity, particularly if, if you're affiliated with a, with a party, and in particular here, the Conservative Party, um, you can have discussions with uh, people who are maybe in the federal party and they may be more persuadable and you know <laughs> it, it's a, maybe a longer term process but if you can start opening the minds of people who are primarily driven by federal considerations they may also be starting to open space for that conversation at the provincial level but you know 
this this is all political. So the the parties that are in power want to be in power, and they're perfectly. I mean, we, we see this all the time with uh, NDP parties at the federal level. They've been generally supportive of a move towards proportional representation, but when they come into power at the provincial levels, they like the power they get from first past the post, so they don't make the moves there. And so there's a kind of schism, or yeah, you know, yeah, within the party, they don't uh, they're not able to connect the dots across the two levels. So I want to address just for our last question here, a couple of people asking about citizens assemblies asking somebody's asking is Fairville Canada supporting a citizens assembly at the provincial level as well and somebody else asking. Um, we've had so many citizens assemblies over the years, uh, how do we, you know, that haven't resulted in change so a couple of answers to that question. Um, yes, we are promoting a new Ontario Citizens Assembly on electoral reform, as well as strongly promoting a National Citizens Assembly on electoral reform. And the reason is really simple. Uh, as Tony just outlined, politicians, regardless of the color brand, cannot see past their own partisan self-interest. They cannot try to imagine a bunch of uh, nurses in a hospital put together on a committee and said, okay, we're going to have to downsize this hospital significantly, which means we're going to have to lay off a, you know, whole bunch of you. Why don't you all get together in a committee and just design us out how that's going to happen and who's going to be out. They can't do it. Of course they can't do it. It's not reasonable to expect them to do it because they're looking after their own self-interest when the boundaries are redrawn. They not might not will to run again. They might not win again. They're looking at their party's self-interest. We have to get this. There's no easy way to PR. But as a next step, we have to get this out of the hands of politicians um, who, you know, so we are advocating a new citizens assembly in Ontario. There actually haven't been that many citizens assemblies since the uh, citizens assembly in BC in 2004, you know, uh, they have been taking off around the world. It wasn't big like it is now. Now citizens assemblies are spreading uh, all over the world. A lot has been learned in the last 20 years about how to make them more effective. A lot of effort is being made to learn how citizens assemblies can engage with the broader population and bring people who aren't in that room um, in. And it's been a long time since the Ontario Citizens Assembly. And th there has only been two citizens assemblies. One of them, I would say, succeeded in a fantastic way. It won 58% of the vote in the BC referendum. Um, the Ontario Citizens Assembly, unfortunately, was sabotaged by the political interests in Ontario at the time who had no interest in letting anybody know that they existed, just for example. So a big part of our advocacy for Citizens Assembly in Ontario is the political leadership to give that assembly the publicity and the funds that it needs to let Ontarians know that a group of their fellow citizens are doing this work on their behalf. So it's a common ground next step that we can push every party to act on regardless of their system preference. So I really encourage you to, to push the parties in that direction rather than pushing them to fight with each other about particular systems because that ends badly every single time. Yeah. And I would point out that there are uh, two efforts toward uh, um, two steps towards citizens assemblies that are currently happening in Canada. One is in Prince Edward Island, where uh, last month or so uh, there there was a motion that got passed uh, in in their house. A, a little surprisingly, I think, to everybody. Um, but if you're in PEI or no people in PEI, please uh, support that and and. Uh, Talk it up so that uh, everybody knows that uh, that you really appreciate the the, um, uh, the is it MLAs there in PEI who uh, from all parties from the Liberals from the Conservatives and from the Greens who uh, uh, who supported that and the NDP sorry I'm blanking do the NDP have seats there no sorry um, but and also in the city of Vancouver uh, the City Council earlier in the year. Uh, passed a um, motion to ask staff to evaluate the feasibility of running a citizens assembly. There's a very tight timeline on that because we have elections next fall, fall 2022. Um, and it's not, uh, I don't think that that's very widely known, but that did get passed. We're trying to push to find out what's happening inside the, the uh, <laughs> the depths of city hall and, and find out if that's actually going to come back to council. Um, but those are at least two places where there is movement towards a citizens assembly. Right. To uh, bring everybody, you know, up to speed with what Tony said, you know, hope is a priceless 
commodity in the electoral reform movement, those of us who have fought so hard for so long uh, for this. So the best thing you can do to encourage people that this is actually possible is to share what's happening in PEI. So uh, about three, four weeks ago, the PEI legislature voted to have a citizens assembly on PR. So just to, just to think this didn't come out of the blue, um, this is the result of 17 years of work in PEI by PEI-based advocates who lost a referendum in 2005, won a plebiscite in 2016 only to have the government say we don't feel like acting on that, uh, lost a set up to fail referendum in 2019 by only 1.5% of the vote, and now just want to vote in the legislature to, to take this out of the hands of referendum politicians and put it into a representative group of citizens because there was a recognition by um, some MLAs, at least from all parties, that people on PEI want this and they want a system that is going to work for PEI. And so this is just like an exciting, it's an exciting development of of what can happen and just not to give up. And we'll be following that uh, really closely. And we hope maybe the Ontario Liberal Party will be following how much, uh, how excited people are to see that process happening. Um, I wanted to also just one more thing, a couple, some people have brought up referendums. Okay, referendum, I just very quickly. Uh, last year, I did another one of these kind of, this is a long webinar with bad news referendums that I really don't like to do, but it was totally necessary. It's on our web, it's on our YouTube channel, uh, youtube.com slash Canada. Look under webinars, find the referendums webinar with the same kind of title page. Uh, after eight referendums, we've learned a lot about what goes on in referendums um, from impartial experts. It's not good news. It's not a path to reform. Um, politicians offering a referendum, that's basically their way of saying no. Um, and so if you want more details on that, why we're supporting citizens assemblies, trustworthy citizens assemblies over referendums, you can watch that webinar. Um, okay, do we have, is there anything else we should address, Tony, before we let these wonderful people who have stayed with us for an hour and a half? Yeah, thanks. Uh, yeah, I think uh, there are a couple of other um, questions, but I think we've addressed uh, almost every one of those. So. Yeah. Spread, spread the word when I send out the video for this, um, share this. This is something we need our core. It's hard to explain in two minutes or less. This is something we need our core supporters to know that this is not a step to PR. It's a step to mm -hmm. nowhere. Um, so the best thing you can do is share it with other people who really care about this movement. Um, there's also, uh, if you go on the front of fairvote.ca, if you live in Ontario, you'll find a, a big box uh, with, uh, I think I've got Del Duca and Henry Ford about how you can have any voting system you like as long as it's a ranked ballot. <laughs> if you click on that, it'll take you to a link to an action where you can send a message to Ontario uh, NDP leader, Andrea Horvath and uh, Ontario Green leader, Mike Schreiner calling on them to speak up and show some leadership. And we can all uh, also probably coming in the next month or two will be a fundraiser for the advertising that we desperately need to be able to push back on Stephen Del Duca's plan. So those are all ways that you can support us. And of course, sharing our things on Fair Vote from Fair Vote Canada's Twitter and Fair Vote Ontario's Twitter. Okay. Sure. Thank you very much, everyone. Thanks. Thanks, okay. everyone. Bye. Take care. Bye-bye.